Okay, today we're reviewing Chapter 13, Experiments and Observational Studies. Uh, this is the last of the three different ways of producing data that we discussed. We had simulation in Chapter 11, survey and sampling in Chapter 12, and then this. So observational study is when you are observing individuals for response, but you're not influencing what's happening to them in any way. Prospective studies, you identify them now and follow them into the future, like maybe this year's kindergartners, and then see um, how many music classes they take over time and how that influences possibly, or how that's related to possibly something like GPA. A retrospective would be identifying participants now and then mining existing past data about them. So like maybe this year's 12th graders and music classes that they took in the past and GPA. Okay. Um, most of chapter 13, however, is about experiment. Experiment, you deliberately impose treatment to subjects and measure the response. Three principles of good experimental design. Make sure you always talk about these if you're asked to design an experiment. You must mention how you are going to control for lurking variables in a comparative design. So you need a control group that's receiving the baseline treatment or whatever. Uh, you need random assignment of subjects to treatment. Otherwise, you can't talk about cause and effect. And you need replication. That means you need enough experimental units in each group so that differences between groups can be distinguished from chance variation. If you only have one subject in each group, how do I know that those subjects weren't just naturally different from each other and rather than my treatment actually causing the differences? Okay. Lots of vocabulary you need to know for experiments. Lurking variable, that's a variable that's not among your X or Y variables that might influence the response. So let's say our explanatory variable is how much water I'm giving tomato plants and the response variable is how many tomatoes they produce. Well, if I didn't control for everything else, you know, very well, then maybe sunlight is different among my different groups. And so that might be a lurking variable that I didn't control for that is influencing how many tomatoes I get. Confounding occurs when two variables are associated in such a way that their effects on a response variable cannot be distinguished from each other. So for example, if I'm applying different, you know, water amounts to my different groups of tomato plants, but I also have them in different kinds of sunlight, you know, maybe this group over here has a little sunlight, this group has more sunlight, then how do I know whether, you know, the amount of tomatoes produced was caused by the water or the sunlight or some combination of both? I don't because I didn't control well, so that's called confounding. Be very aware of using this terminology correctly on the AP exam. If you're, if you're using this word and you don't use it exactly right, um, they will take off points on the exam, so be very careful about that. So if you're not sure, leave it out. Use a different word. Okay, a treatment is the combination of the specific values of all the X variables that you're applying in the experiment. So for example, the one I just talked about, water level, levels of water that I'm applying would be the treatment. So maybe level one, level two, level three, water. Now if I also have sunlight, because I'm going to try to avoid confounding with that, so I'm going to purposely manipulate the sunlight also, maybe I have three levels of sunlight, levels one, level two, level three. So that would be nine treatments I would need, three times three, because I need all possible combinations of my different uh, levels to make sure I have groups uh, to avoid confounding there. Okay, now experimental units or subjects is the terminology to refer to who is receiving the treatment. Experimental units usually refers to objects or animals, and subjects usually refers to people. Factor is just another word for your X variable, so like water amount is a factor or sunlight amount is a factor. Um, level is a specific value that that factor can take on, so like one milliliter water or two milliliter water, so on and so forth. Okay. A control group is the treatment group that receives the baseline levels of all factors for comparison purposes. So maybe they receive the placebo, maybe they're receiving level one of water and level one of sunlight, you know, whatever the baseline is. Um, so that, you, Or maybe they're receiving the old medicine and we're going to compare it with the new medicine, so on and so forth. Very important to have a control group so that you can compare. A placebo is a treatment that has no active ingredient, so often that is occurring in medical studies where they have identical looking pills um, and one of them is just a sugar pill or something like that, but the other one has the actual medicine. Blinding is preventing subjects from knowing what treatment they're receiving because psychologically that can have an impact 
um, if they do know. Single blind means they don't know. Uh, double blind means that they don't know, and the people who interact with them, like their doctors or whatever, also don't know, because that you know that could also possibly influence um, how they respond. Statistically significant means that some observed effect uh, effect in your response variable is so large that it would rarely occur by chance. So, for example, if you're doing a study on some medicine and uh, the group receiving level two has a you know drastically different or significantly different heart rate than those receiving other levels and you have enough people in that group you're probably going to be convinced that it isn't just chance that it's the actually the treatment that's making the difference so we would say it's statistically significant now there are three types of experimental design you're responsible for on the AP exam first is completely randomized design which is akin to an SRS when sampling um, but don't call it an SRS because that's only for sampling. So you start with the subjects and then you divide them into one group for each treatment. So if you have three treatments, three groups. If you have nine treatments, nine groups. And then you have to randomly assign them to the group. So probably the easiest way to do that is say put all their names in a hat or something like that. And then uh, you know draw a name, put that in the first group, draw a name, put it in the second group, draw a name, put it in the third group and then so on and so forth until they're all in groups. Okay, apply treatments to to the different groups. You know, so this group gets treatment one, this group gets treatment two, so on and so forth. And then measure the response variable, such as the height of the tomato plants or how many tomatoes they're producing and compare. Now, randomized block design is the same as a completely randomized design, except you're basically doing what is akin to stratifying in sampling. You're breaking them into pre-existing groups where they're all alike within a group. So maybe pre-existing groups of men and women, if I think this medicine might, might work differently based on gender. Or maybe tomato plants bought at store A and store B, because I'm not sure if the plants are, might not be somehow different because of where they came from. And then within each group, then you break into the different treatments and assign um, all the different randomly assign um, all the plants or subjects to the treatments and then apply the treatments and then you will measure the response variable and compare within each block don't compare one block with another you know if I thought this medicine was different for men and women to begin with why am I going to compare and look for a difference I think they're different to begin with what I want to do is look at how did all the different treatments you know compare amongst the women and how did all the different treatments compare amongst men for example Okay, match pair design is the last kind that you are responsible for, and that is you start with you know your subjects, you separate them into pairs where you think they're all alike in important characteristics. So maybe person A and person B, all you know the same height, weight, gender, different things that I think might matter, or and you'd have to have some information. You wouldn't want to just be guessing, you know, about what matters. Or another kind of match pair design is when you have each individual receive two treatments, like treatment A, then treatment B. So if, you do, if you're pairing, then what you have is uh, you randomly assign which one in the pair gets which treatment. If you have an individual getting both treatments, then you're randomly assigning which order they get them, like do I get treatment A first and then B or vice versa. So you apply the treatments and then you measure response and compare within the pairs or within each individual. Okay, um, Some other things that you need to look out for with regard to experimental design is the scope of inference. What kind of conclusions can you make about your experiment? Well, if you have random selection, that is you randomly selected who's participating in the experiment from a larger population, and random assignment is subject to treatment. That's the ideal situation. So because of random selection, you can generalize results to a larger population. And because of random assignment, you can infer cause and effect relationships between treatment and response. Now, that hardly ever happens in the real world, but it would be nice. Random selection only is usually what happens in like a sampling situation. You can generalize to a larger population, but you can't infer cause and effect because you didn't randomly assign subjects to treatment. Random assignment only, which is what often happens in the real world in experimentation, because you usually have volunteers for experiments, you can infer cause and effect, but you have to be very careful about generalizing to a larger population. This is a real problem with modern experimentation. For example, you have maybe a vitamin E study, 
and maybe in this particular study it uh, is associated with hair growth or something like that and so they might say hey if, you know if you need uh, thicker hair or something like that take vitamin E um, but then in the larger population maybe that doesn't work out and that's because maybe that um, group that participated in the experiment is not really representative of the larger population. They weren't randomly selected from a larger population. Now if you have neither random selection nor assignment, then you can't generalize to a larger population and you can't infer cause and effect. That would be very bad. You want to avoid that if you can. <clears throat> All right, go to the next slide. Okay, other things that you need to look out for whoops, in experimentation is the placebo effect. Sorry, we just lost a slide. Go back. Try to get it to go back. Placebo effect we've talked about just that there is a psychological effect of what you perceive your treatment to be even if it's not the truth and that can influence um, how you respond, whether you get better or worse. Um, other issues in modern experimentation is the issue of consent. For example, can parents consent on behalf of children who don't want to participate? Or can mentally ill people you know, consent to participate in an experiment? Uh, we're still grappling with those issues today. Uh, the issue of harm is something that uh, ethics around has evolved over time. Today, even if you're just writing a college research paper that involves some experimentation, you might have to send your design through a review board to get it approved to make sure that you're not causing harm to any of your subjects. Um, the issue of harming animals is a modern ethical issue that is still being, you know, we're still evolving on what our standards are for that. Publishing concerns, this is a modern issue with experimentation that is very, very serious. You know, when we talk about inference, we talk about uh, rejecting the null or failing to reject the null. But what we've discovered is that reports that fail to reject the null are less likely to get published, part because people say, oh, well, nothing happened, so why submit it? But also because, you know, people who publish the magazines are less likely to publish ones where the null is rejected. And, and that can give a very misleading impression of what's going on out there in the research. Um, so we have lots of issues of ethics of publishing, who gets published, why, what, um, too soon, too late, and you know, and so a lot of our science is under question in these days because of publishing concerns. So we have to watch out for ethics and carefulness of publishing. Unnatural settings is another issue. If you design an experiment and you're trying to find out, you know, something about how people would respond in a given situation, if your situation, you know, in your experiment is just too unnatural, like too fake then it really might not match what actually happens in the real world very well. And so then, um, you know, your conclusions from your experiment might not really apply to the real world because it's just too different. So these are all things that come up in experiment design. You know, there's a lot to think about and, uh, it, you know, to be able to make valid conclusions and apply them to some sort of real world situation. So on the AP exam, again, mainly you need to watch out for terminology. You can be expected to be asked to analyze experiments, look for problems, identify treatments and levels, um, maybe uh, read a situation and design an experiment, talk about how you would assign. You might want to review in your textbook uh, drawing experimental diagrams because that can be a good way to um, talk about how you're designing your experiment. Although in and of themselves, they're not enough for your design, you would need the words to go with that as well. And that concludes um, our review of chapter 13. Okay, stop.